they're on the CPU, so they're quick access. But um, okay. But the point is, basically, uh, they can be used for specific capabilities. So let's say you wanted to find out, and and this is how something like Jumer or Toluca would do it. They would go and they'd say, okay, I want to see if the syscenter EIP that the syscenter is going to be pointing at, I want to see if that's pointing at the KI fast uh, system call or whatever it was called. So it should always be pointing at that one particular thing in kernel space. Uh, and so what they would do is they'd say, okay, move uh, 176 to, to ECX, and then they do read MSR. And that'll read the 64 bit register into EDX, uh, you know, concatenated with EAX. So the lower 32 bits are going to be in uh, EAX. So I just say EAX now contains the value here because this particular 64-bit one, the, the uh, upper bits don't matter because this is being used for a 32-bit value. So that would be how you would read out the MSR and say, you know, what's in it currently? And then you'd compare it. You'd say, does this 32-bit offset look like the address of KI fast call entry or whatever it was? Uh, simultaneously, let's say you wanted, if you were a rootkit and you wanted to hook this thing and you wanted to make it so that when someone calls syscenter, it doesn't point at the default thing anymore. It points at your code instead. Then what you do is you'd set EAX you know, to the, the place you want it to be. Uh, this would be the target of, this would be the EIP which is going to be used when the syscenter is called. So you'd set that to the EIP that you want. You'd set ECX again to be the uh, sys, um, MSR that you want to deal with. And then you just call write MSR. And then at that point, it would take that and it would write it into this model specific register. And there was actually uh, an example of this in the rootkits class there, or in the homework. So going into this, if you uh, scroll towards the top of your GMER results, for instance, and pass the SSCP right here. So in your GMER results, there's a field where it says, type is syscenter. And all it did was it went in, it called the read MSR uh, function on MSR number 176, and it said, okay, I got the value out. The literal value was F8 DB blah, blah, blah. That is not pointing at the correct default value of KI fast syscall. Yeah, I fast call entry. Right? So syscenter on a normal Windows system should always point into KI fast call entry in NTS kernel .exe or NT kernel PA. Right? And so just by reading out that MSR value, you can see the attacker has changed this so that uh, in the VM it now points to F8, D8, B, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's how you'd see it in Gmer. And in Luca, it has a specific thing here as well where it's saying, interesting, it's saying suspicious is no, even though it's clearly calling out that this is not pointing at the uh, default entry. Well, that's interesting. But it, it didn't put it in as red, but like I said, typically Gmer will only put things in red if it is something associated with a known leak kit. So for all the other changes, they just say, here's the change, that's your problem to figure out. But uh, but they only ever put things in red if it's due to a new kit that they know about. Actually, let me see if I can find that quick. There's actually a little file for Gmer where it'll say, here's the specific things I'm looking for that I'll consider root kit. And it's interesting because then you can see what some root kits do just based on this list. So, uh, let's, let's say, um, <coughs> I think this is it. <clears throat> no, that's not it. All right, I'll remind myself to go find that at the next break. Yep, good question. 
right? The read MSR, write MSR are actually restricted to ring zero only. So these are examples where only ring zero code is allowed to issue these commands because otherwise user space code could just point it wherever and crash the system at a whim. So that is correct. And similarly, it would only make sense for an attacker to actually use them if they were already in kernel space in order to target it at their code. All right, and small correction on your slides if you're planning on using them in the future. I put literal read MSR and write MSR, but it's actually RD MSR and WR MSR. All right, so that's an example of uh, how you can see the changes which are being made to an MSR. And actually, I just wanted to show quick in the Intel manual, you can go see what all the MSRs are and what they're used for. At the end of section uh, 2B, or 3B actually, in the appendices of Intel Manual Volume 3B, Appendix B has all the MSRs. So you can literally just go in here. You'll find all the mnemonics and stuff like that. You find what they're used for. And so if we try to go find the, yes, yeah, so this one, for instance, I was just looking through this the other day to see if there's anything that looked kind of interesting that I hadn't seen before. So remember I was talking a little bit before about the BIOS can have microcode updates for the CPU in it, which get applied uh, when the BIOS is loaded. There's actually an MSR that can say whether or not uh, an update to the microcode should occur. And uh, let me see, would this be set by the BIOS or not? Yeah, I think this is the kind of thing where it would be set by the BIOS. So the BIOS would execute. It would check the version of the microcode currently in the CPU. It would check the version that it's holding to see, you know, do I need to update the CPU? And then if it does, it's probably going to write into this MSR to say, you know, trigger the update, and then it's, you know, going to do a reboot or whatever it has to do in order to get that microcode applied to the uh, applied to the CPU. So there's various interesting things in here: SMM monitor configuration, stuff like that. But all of these, so. Okay, there we go, sorry. So last thing, so actually, I'm not going to go into it, but in the SysCenter instructions, it actually uses a bunch of simplifying assumptions, which I think are largely behind the performance gains versus using an interrupt. So we said SysCenter um, is how you're supposed to go from user space to kernel space now. But it can only be used in specific condition, and that condition is this other register, this center CS, is pointing at a, so CS is like, you know, a code segment register. It should have a segment selector in it that selects a segment that starts at zero and goes to four gigabytes. And we said by default everything pretty much does that anyways nowadays, but this is now kind of really codifying it that if you want to use SysCenter, you must use segments from zero to maximum. Uh, and you must set S CS to, the, to point at one of them. And then actually the next entry in the GDP has to be, so whereas this is code segment, the next entry is going to be assumed to be the data segment, the SS register, which will be used with this ESP. So we said, you know, you're always implicitly using a logical address. And here you're basically just setting it up to use, you know, CS colon EIP. So there's your CS, there's your EIP. And then it actually just assumes that whatever the thing in the GDP is after the CS you're pointing at, that's the uh, thing that'll be used for SS. So that's SS and there's your ESP. So between the two of those, you have a code logical address and you've got a data logical address. And those are what are used when you call SysCenter to transition into kernel space. So you can go look up the SysCenter instruction in the manual if you want to see more about that. But, but it's just interesting that there's, they're now kind of really codifying that you must use those simple giant cover all of memory segments because no one was using anything more complicated than that anyway, so no one was using that. All right. So anyways, you know, wander around in the, the MSR thing later. Is there a question on the uh, phone? No. All right. So you can wander around through the MSR thing later seeing what sort of miscellaneous stuff they have there. All right. And here's some more references where 
if you'd like to go read those, they'll talk more about the system call transitions that we were just talking about. All right, so that was just talking about, you know, the potential for hooking SysCenter. We said it's really just SysCenter has these MSRs that are controlling it, specifically that EIP one. And one of our uh, proof of concept rootkits here, all it did was it went in and wrote that to point at the attacker's code. And it was li literally just a pass through. It just immediately went to the original. But, well, before I move on, right? But when the attacker controls this uh, SysCenter EIP thing, he basically can man in the middle all of these calls to uh, the system service descriptor table, right? He's, he is sitting at this level, right? So when you're transitioning, instead of going here, you're going to the attacker code. And now before you call to any of those uh, entries in those tables, <coughs> the attacker can manipulate where you're actually going without having to change those tables. So he can look at your EAX. And before he even bothers to parse any of those tables, he can say, I know for this particular EAX, it corresponds to, you know, write file. And I'm going, then he's going to, you know, control your uh, EIP and, and make you go to his write file instead. All right. So that was about hooking SysCenter a little bit. So the other uh, new hooking technique, which we hadn't had prior exposure to, uh, was hooking the SSDT. And this probably needs to get redone a little bit. Uh, this is a wind debug command that you can use to see each of those pointers to the SSDT at the thread level. So this will go to every single thread. It'll say, where is this pointing? It should be pointing at this one or that one, the regular SSDT or the shadow SSDT. And if you were to issue that command and if you were to see three possible values, then something's up with that third one. You need to figure out which one's normal SSDT, which one's shadow SSDT. If there's any third ones in there, that means uh, someone's pointing to per thread hooks. Isn't that a bad idea? Why didn't they just have a uh, bit thing one or the other? Since then it gives you a place to address. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, why didn't they just have it be one or the other? I would think it's for. Well, I would guess it has to do with, you know, simplicity of the code which parses the AX and parses the thread information. If you say it has to be one or the other, the question becomes, how does that code know where the one or the other is? So it's still going to have to have some data structure somewhere that points at one or the other, right? And yes, the bit could say point that way or that way. But, you know, in the simple case, there'd be like two function pointers, right? But then the attacker could just, or not even function pointer, just data pointers. The attacker could just come in and replace a data pointer. And so the zero or one would no longer be telling you is it good or bad because one of them could just be bad. It could just be a copy that has malicious stuff. So I don't think that would really buy you anything. Kind of, you know, most of these OS design level decisions are such that you assume there's no attacker in the kernel potentially manipulating stuff, right? When you start working from those assumptions, things become harder. All right. So again, this is, uh, no, this is not the black. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about is very few, again, very few of the tools that you could have run would have found this type of manipulation. But there is a function called ke add system service table. And this function, uh, I'm going to that's a function. There's a function called ke add system service descriptor table. And key for hook, which is one of the rootkits which I've installed here, uses this function in order to add an extra, you know, quote, SSDT. And it uses that in order to communicate between user space and kernel space. Uh, and so this is another case where there should only be, well, there should only be certain things in those, well, I'll just get through it and go right here. All right. Um, so in, specifically, it's in that shadow SSDT thing. We were talking about there's four structures here, right? In the normal case, um, I'm gonna use All right. in the normal case, on a system that has no IIS, uh, Microsoft, whatever it is, Internet Information Ser System Services, whatever it is, 
IIS or web server. If you have no IIS web server installed, this is what this KE service descriptor table shadow would look like. You would have the native API, you would have the Win32 one, and then there would be nothing there, nothing there. And when you call KE add system service table, uh, that function basically fills in entries into these things. And actually this Win32K entry was added by the OS calling this function and then it adds in that Win32K entry. So this is meant to be sort of an extensible thing. Similarly, when you have IIS installed, uh, it adds in this IIS uh, spud <coughs> dot this thing, which is going to point out to its own base and it's going to have some array of function pointers which can be called uh, from the user space side of IIS to the kernel space side of things. Now, what an attacker can do, and you know, this isn't necessarily related to hiding, this is potentially more like a backdoor kind of thing or back channel communication. Uh, if the attacker calls this function, as he for hook does, what happens is they get put into this array of uh, four possible entries. And so now, the, oh, I don't have it. All right, well, I need a new slide here, but I'm going to do this on the board. Bill, can we go over to the board? So, whereas the normal thing is going to have four entries, and so the base of this thing is going to point out to some table like that, and the base of that thing is going to point out to some table like that, right? and there's many entries in each of those. That's a normal system with your normal SSDT and your shadow SSDT in that case. Now, when he for hook comes in and it calls this uh, K add system service table, it adds a pointer to this little table like this, which has, I believe, like five entries in it. And so for these five entries, what the user space side of the code does is if the user space side of the code says, you know, move EAX, um, would be 2, 0, 0, 1 or something like that. But let's go with 2, 0, 0, 0 just to be simple to start with. Right, so, and then it does sysenter. The user space side of the code does this. It does move some hard-coded constant into EAX, call sysenter. That, you know, works its way through the normal KI fast uh, call entry, which parses the EAX. And it parses it and it says that's index uh, two. Yeah, two. So it's, this is index zero, this is index one, this is index two. Then it goes ahead and it parses this correctly and it sees, okay, take this base right here and add, uh, take that base, that points at a table, and then take these 12 bits. Those 12 bits are an offset into that table, so let's say the offset is zero, and then call that function right there. And that function then points into uh, these functions all point into for a hook. And these are sort of control functions that, uh, so the user space side can control the kernel side to say, okay, I want you to now add a new uh, file to hide, for instance. So the user space side has this little API where it calls through these SSDTs in order to send commands to the kernel space side. Now that's a particularly uncommon way of doing things, but I thought it still uh, warranted description because uh, that could be caught by, you know, looking at this level. We expect this is going to always point at uh, a particular location for that table. This is going to point for that table. These should be unused unless there's IIS installed, in which case there should be something there, but there should almost certainly never be anything there. So if you had IIS plus C for hook, there shouldn't be anything there. So uh, you could find that sort of uh, back channel communication mechanism, but then they would just go to using IO control, uh, which is the more proper way to do things, and that would be harder to find. So that was just worth mentioning because some tools will tell you this. I think only the one tool we run at the end of tomorrow will uh, 
will even acknowledge that this sort of thing is going on. But that, again, just speaks to the importance of having the tools, knowing what the tools can and cannot find. Right? That's the point of that Excel file saying this can find this. Uh, knowing what they can and can't find and, and whether it's relevant, whether you think it's relevant for you know, finding the, the malware. Finding rootkits. All right. So anyway, the point here was just again to call back to the man in the middle notion. Uh, for this entire process of SSDT hooking, hmm. I really, sh well, yeah, so this is what I didn't really talk about, but we've kind of already covered it a couple times anyways. The point is we know that an attacker can go into this table, like those tables on the board there. You go into, it's just a big table of function pointers. If the attacker points it at their own function, then obviously they will have the opportunity to man in the middle. And so the point is there's many, many places along the path of, you know, from user space to kernel space where an attacker can gain control. <laughs> Along that boundary, that's where you could, you know, the, the transition between user space and kernel space, that's either the interrupt-based transition or sysenter transition. But in either case, there's an opportunity for the attacker. They're kind of on the kernel space side of things, but they're still able to immediately uh, control at that transition. When that transition goes to KI, you know, fast call entry or anything like that, they can grab control again. When they go to whatever functions in the SSDT, they can grab control again. When they go to the function, they can grab control again with an inline hook. So many opportunities here and you have to know, uh, you have to know of these opportunities and then you have to know which tools will detect what along this path. And then uh, there can also be issues of false positives in your tools. So I previously talked about, you know, the McAfee false positives where they put inline jump instructions in your kernel. Uh, then you can have this case where Semantic, for instance, will uh, have false positives that are actually very difficult in order to attribute to Semantic. So this would be like uh, SEP, you know, Semantic Enterprise Protection. For all of these SSDT entries, which unfortunately doesn't tell me their index, but in Gmer, where you run SEP on, you know, one of these systems that has, or sorry, if you were to run Gmer on one of these systems that has SEP installed, you'd see something like this. And the problem is, Gmer is trying to look up that 81EB36A0. It's trying to look that up and it's saying, this doesn't correspond to any kernel module that I know about. And that turns out to be because this is actually dynamically allocated memory. So Semantic creates some space on the heap copy some code to there, some little subcode, which is going to have the hook code. And then when an SSD entry is called, it calls to this semantic subcode, which calls to semantic, and then eventually it calls the original. But the problem is when you can't attribute it like that, how do you know that this is semantic versus you know, some bad guy who just did the exact same thing? Create some you know, space on the heap, copy some code there, and hook. Uh, and so this is, again, one of the things in the tiddly wiki where I go in and show how you would actually have to look at this in order to say, okay, this is or isn't semantic uh, doing these sort of folks. So specifically in the case of RVM, all right, so I said there's sysenter, which is causing hooks, and that's, you know, uh, that was a malicious sysenter.sys that I put on the system. Then there's, there, you can see there's a ton of SSDT things that are listed here, right? But then the question becomes, what's malicious, what's not, who's doing what, all these sort of things. So one thing here is uh, trustier rapport, which is something which is trying to do, well, I think what they're trying to do is looking for people, uh, looking for malware that's, you know, stealing your banking credentials like keystroke logging while you're uh, connecting to your bank's website or something like that. So they're kind of trying to stop keystroke logging. Uh, but, you know, in trying to stop the malware, they put themselves in a ton of places on the system, but at least they're roughly attributable to them. You know, again, with all of these quote attributions, you always have to ask yourself, is this rapport PG or is this malware that's just named itself that, right? So you kind of don't know unless you have some trusted path to get binaries and all that. Um, actually, though, I do want to go over to Toluca quick. I want to see if it can do checking of uh, driver signatures. Mm. 
No, it can't. So I think at this point I want to pull down uh, the virus block ADA tool because I know that that can do digital signature checking. So, well, let me see. Before I lose my train of thought, yeah, that's fine. So we're gonna we're gonna pull down um, virus block ADA in order to uh, have this thing, which I'm claiming is you know one of the best tools. So the path for that is so the last class I didn't realize that the beta version is not on their main site. So you need to grab from this directory. So inside of your VM in Internet Explorer, put in FTP colon slash slash anti dash virus dot by slash beta slash VBA thirty two AR kit underscore beta dot zip. <coughs> Save it to your desktop. Unzip it. Now at least in this case I do know that it is going to go out try to go out to the network, but I did look at its network traffic and it is trying to consult with the VeriSign uh, certificate revocation list. So they say they're doing that specifically because of the Stuxnet case where it has a valid digital signature, but they're trying to go out and see, you know, is this digital signature revoked because, you know, they revoked the ones that were used for Stuxnet. So, what do you got? Not finishing it? I'm not going to because I want to switch between the different things to show how they look. If you put it in this mode, it's not going to let you switch out to apps. And I think the whole point of this mode is that it's going to set the system so that no new processes can launch, no new kernel drivers can launch. So it's kind of like holding the system in steady state. I'm just going to run it in the non-blocking mode. I Typically you should say yes. Right now you can say no if you want. So you can go back and forth. All right. So like Gmer, this has a mode where you can just, you know, scan. So you can click all these check marks, hit start, and then it'll go check everything. I just want to show a couple of things independently, so I'm not going to do it that way. Also, I'm going to turn off the, well, uh, I'm going to leave that on. I'm going to leave the checking digital signatures on. That's why I said I was coming here. But I'm just going to block it with, uh, with uh, zone one. So under tools, this is where you can get to the specific different uh, types of checks if you don't want to run the full scan. So I'm going to go to kernel mode hooks, or tools, kernel mode hooks. And then this is going to scan for a bunch of stuff like SSDT changes, I think inline hooks, IAT hooks, EAT hooks, and then of course, once again, too big for my screen. Awesome. All right. So if it's asking to go out to the network, say no, deny it, and remember this setting. And then go up, try to check your sign certificate revocation list. What? Yeah, I think just. Uh, Move it over to the side and then click that. Yeah, so if it's too big for your VM as well, move it to the side and then click the little maximize window, this one right there. So this looks like it's saying here's some IAT modifications, here's some EAT modifications. Uh, notice that Gmer didn't say anything about EAT modifications before. That's export address table modifications. Um, is yours working? Yeah, so go to tools. And then, oh, so you clicked on the, the full one. So hit cancel and see if that is stopping. 
You may have to quit it, open again, and just go to tools. But yeah, if you do the full run, then it takes forever. So EAT modifications, Gmer didn't actually tell us about that. And let's see who's to blame here. Uh, looks like that's uh, vsdatamt.sys. That's zone alarm again. So export address table modifications. We said the reason an attacker, or in this case, a zone alarm, would want to do export address table modification is that you can, when, a, when you inject something into a module's memory space and you change all the IAT entries, that just changes whatever is there right now. But if something new comes in along later, so if a new DLL gets loaded or a new kernel module gets loaded, your code would have to go in and you know, modify the IAT for this new stuff. But if instead you just modify the export address table so that the offset, the quote offset to this function is you know, completely outside of the scope of that particular module and it points all the way offsetting to the attacker code, then the OS basically just does your job for you. The next time something loads, the you know, base address plus the offset equals the attacker code and the OS loader fills that into the IAT of the new thing. All right, so as you're seeing, it's you know, running through processing stuff. Green is coming up uh, for things which you can verify the digital signature for. And for things which you can't, uh, that shows up. Well, things which you can't or things which are locked file, those show up in, in red or yellow or whatever. So the nice thing here, the big thing I want to say here is with VBA, basically everything that shows up in this view, you can roll back. So for all these IAT modifications, you right click and you can click restore. Don't click restore. You'll probably blue screen your box. Because you if you roll back everything all at once, then it's probably fine. But sometimes if you roll back one change but not the others, then it'll blue screen. So don't do that. But the point is you could do it if you wanted to. So all these IAT, EAT, et cetera, these things can all be rolled back. So here's a code modification. This is like a dot text section modification. That was the one by uh, debugview, dbgv.sys. So you can roll that back. Debugview will never again show you any of these changes. And so, you know, this is kind of relevant both for, you know, reverting rootkit changes as well as messing with security software. So the point is, if you roll back the security software changes, most of them are not smart enough to, like, put their changes back. And therefore, if you roll back these changes, all of a sudden zone alarm will stop filtering all of your network traffic, right? And so uh, security tools definitely need to up their game because if an attacker comes in, they can just roll back all the changes. The security software is blind. And we've used that for proof of concept attacks in the past in order to show you know, certain security vendors that they, uh, they're not so hot. All right, so then still there's all these SSDP entries. And so looking for ones which are not in green, so, so this is the nice thing here is that you can focus on <coughs> things that are not green and you can actually, if you want, you can click don't display trusted items and then all that green stuff will go away. And suddenly you're left with a much more manageable list of changes, right? So as long as the you know, third party software is at least going to the trouble of signing their code, that will help you know, eliminate some of these things to the degree that you trust that signed code is automatically <coughs> trustworthy which you shouldn't necessarily, because again, Stuxnet had signed drivers. They stole a digital signature, right? And then they signed their code. But the point is, this is always where you want to start. For everything that's unsigned, start there and then, you know, go ahead and check, uh, add the signed stuff back in later. So, for instance, here's that IAT hook, right? Int E. If we wanted, we could just restore this and then all of a sudden, Shadow Walker is no longer, you know, hiding memory. Sysenter right here saying IA32 Sysenter EIP could restore that. And, you know, no longer is that proof of concept code interposing on that. So this is some of the, you know, so this should be one of the lessons learned coming out of this class is that you use the appropriate tools and for that restoration portion of the homework, you know, I said, how can you remove the changes? You know, one way is you can try to identify where the changes come from, remove those files. Other way is you can use appropriate tools. Now, the point is, if you just do this, if you just restore this, the next time you reboot, it's going to be back, right? So that's not necessarily going to be 
the best way to remove rootkit changes, right? You probably want to still identify which files are causing them and remove those files. But removing the hooks is a good first start because then if they're hiding their files or they're blocking you from accessing their files, then if you've removed their hooks, that stops them from blocking you. And then as long as you know which files to remove, then uh, you can do so. So that's what I want to say here. I think the only, yep, yeah, so this is literally the only, out of all the IAT, out of all those tons of SSDT changes, there's only one thing which is the actual rootkit here. Uh, it's this control ctr 12 capsys This thing is trying to impersonate that it's control to capsys which is a, a sys internals tool which is also installed. So if you look through some other mechanisms, you'd see, okay, control to cap is installed. You go Google control to cap, you see, okay, it's a system internals tool to say, you know, your caps lock key can be used as your control key. Uh, using a mechanism that we'll talk about later. And then were you to maybe go skimming through, you wouldn't necessarily notice this is a 1 instead of a L and you'd say, okay, well, that's just the control to cap change. That all makes sense, right? Uh, but in, in reality, this is something where it's actually just trying to do some of that hiding in plain sight, blending in. It names itself like an existing file that it knows is on the system. And this one in particular, this is for those of you who found the hidden directory cool beans, underscore cool, underscore beans. Um, this is just a modified, there's like one of the proof of concept files off of rootkit.com. It hid any directory or files that started with underscore cool. I think it was originally underscore root and then they changed it to underscore cool. So I just made a folder called underscore cool, underscore beans, and then that was hidden. And this is the actual module which implements that. And how it implements it is that it's hooking the SSDT for the function NT query directory file. And as the name sort of implies, NT query directory is the thing which is called to list the files in a directory. So if you hook the thing which lists the files in the directory, you can remove files from the directory listing. And that's all this does. It hides anything. You know, if you go in here right now, you create a new directory called underscore cool underscore anything else, it'll just immediately disappear. <coughs> because this thing is going to be hiding it. Um, this was just a proof of concept thing off of rootkit.com where it was like a basic hide file or something like that. I have to check the team there. Which I don't think I have the wiki open anymore. So I don't know. <coughs> All right. So anyways, you've got false positives potentially for the SSDT. Uh, only thing I wanted to say was that um, okay. Virus block ADA can roll back a bunch of those changes uh, for anything that was found there. All right, any question on SSDT hooking before we go on? So we saw sort of hooking sysenter. We saw um, changing the actual table entries there where this, this data structure that has four possible entries, typically the first entry is pointing at the quote normal SSTT entries and then the next entry is pointing at graphical GDI entries. Uh, and so you can change the actual things in that function pointer table and then the attacker gains control. control. Any questions about SSTT? Anyone on the phone? All right. That's all we're going to say about SSTT. So SSTT was a new thing we hadn't really seen in other classes and this next thing is as well. So this is uh, IO request packets or IRPs. So IRPs are an abstraction layer within Windows that's used for, generically used for input output. So this can refer to input output to, you know, hard drive, network, keyboard, stuff like that. It can be used for a lot of different things. So, well, I think the picture describes it best. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Uh, there's two sort of objects that really matter here. There's driver objects, which correspond basically one to one to when you load a kernel driver into memory, you get a driver object. That actually gets passed to the main function of the, the driver, the driver entry function. 
uh, it gets the, the kernel gives it a func uh, gives it this data structure the driver object. There's also then device objects, and this is what relates to uh, I/O request packets or IRPs. And the device objects are basically used to create a linked list saying you know which driver objects want to find out about I/O requests. So um, this is a useful uh, look at it, and actually. I haven't put in references into your book yet, uh, but I really should. There's a uh, good picture of this as well in, actually, my book. So there's actually a good description of this. Chapter 8, if you look at uh, page 461. You'll see an alternate version of this picture, which is sort of useful. Uh, I want you to see that quick because I didn't make an equivalent picture. I probably should have a, a, a little animation thing here. But on page 461, figure 8.2, this sort of shows the way that an IRP or IO request packet sort of travels along this chain. So it starts at the top at the IO manager. And then you've got this IRP, which you can think of as basically like an abstract blob of data that's you know, going to a device. That blob of data can be a packet. It can be some you know, sector that you want written to the hard drive. And so basically, it starts at the top, and it keeps going down to each of these uh, driver objects. And then they can say that the specific device can say whether it wants to hear about it or not. That was uh, page 461. You have their book late. 461, the picture at the top, figure 8.2. So the uh, IO request packet is sort of traveling along this chain from top to bottom. And each thing in this chain has an opportunity to say, I want to handle this IO request, or I'm just going to pass this along. And so if everything says, you know, I'm not going to handle this, it eventually gets to the bottom of the chain, it has to handle it. So in this particular case, I've showed what the uh, IO request chain looks like for uh, the control to cap, which I said is a system kernel tool, which I installed in the VM. Uh, and so control to cap actually attached to an existing chain. So before you install control to cap, there's this existing chain, these bottom three entries. Right? And so control to cap basically attached to, it said, I want to see uh, data that's being targeted for keyboard class zero, which is a device that pertains to the keyboard. And it's basically a device where keystroke information is going to be going. And so specifically what controlled cap, I said controlled cap is just used for switching the control key and the caps key. So you know that on some uh, different <coughs> systems, their keyboards have a control where the caps lock key is. I can't remember if it was Sun or who it was. But there's some uh, keyboards out there that have it that way. And people like it that way, Unix types people. Um, and so this control to cap is basically putting it in itself into this chain so that it can find out when you're pressing the control or the caps lock key. And when it sees that coming down on this chain, when it sees that IO request packet coming down or, or the data coming back up, it can say, I want to you know, swap around uh, what's actually happening on this system. So yeah, so this is all I wanted to say here was that notionally, you've got driver objects. Each of them can have a name, but they can also not have a name. So this is what you'd see if you actually look at it. It, it, tend, it ends up not having a name. Or a bunch of these. Um, and so, one second. Yeah, so what I'd want to say here is there's two possibilities for rootkit type behavior at dealing with these IO request packets. Uh, the first one, can we go to the board? Uh, sorry, the screen, Bill. The first opportunity for rootkit type things here, and we're thinking of you know man in the middle level activity, is it's essentially exactly what control to cap is doing. We said up there at the top, like that picture, there's the I/O manager, which is uh, passing these I/O request packets up and down this chain. So one thing you can do here is you can come in and you can interpose on this chain. You can say I want to be at this level or I want to be at that level, and so you know maybe you're getting data that's being targeted to keyboard class zero. That could go right there. Or maybe you want data you know, that's being targeted to this actual raw device, something like that. So this is uh, called attaching a filter driver. 
in that you want to filter data coming down or coming up uh, depending. And so you place yourself, you place your driver such that I have those moves backwards. You place your uh, yes, I have those names backwards. Oh, but you don't have the slide anyways. You place your driver, so you're loading up some new driver, and you know there's this chain of IO request packets somewhere that are going, you know, up and down a stack targeting some device, you know, keyboard class zero or some other lower device. And you know there's data in that chain that you want to intercept. It could be file data. So if the thing is eventually targeting like a uh, hard drive, then you maybe want to intercept that file data and change the data or, you know, just leave the data. It could be keyboard data. In this case, this would be a chain where there's uh, uh, keystrokes moving up. Well, you can conceptually think of them as keystrokes moving up and down the chain. You're pressing. Uh, it can be things like packets. You can similarly have a, a, a chain of IO request packets going for uh, packet data and other things. So the first level of rootkit type inner position or man in the middling here is just loading up a driver and saying, for this particular thing, I want to be an upper driver. I want to, you know, be above it in the chain, or I want to be a lower driver. And so that's what uh, control the cap is doing right now. In the book, uh, when it's done talking about this IO request packet, uh, it goes on to give an example of a keystroke logger, which looks basically exactly the same as this chain. Yep. So this is control to cap, but in the book, you'll actually see that there's a, a keystroke logger which places itself exactly where control to cap is. And it is basically filtering when this data comes down. Uh, and here's where I unfortunately have to get more detailed than I want to. But, and this may be confusing and ask questions if this isn't clear. Um, the IO control manager in this particular case of keystrokes, the IO, con uh, IO control IO control manager is preemptively sending down requests to say, do you, hey, dear hardware, do you have any keystrokes yet? And so it's sending down an IRP and it's going down and then when, uh, when the hardware says, yeah, I've got a keystroke, then there's these uh, completion routines which occur where this says, here's the function I want to call when an IO request has been successfully, uh, uh, when there's actually data that's coming back from the hardware down at the bottom level. So this says, I want to be called at this function when uh, we find out that there's uh, new data coming back. So this guy gets a callback and this one, maybe this one doesn't register a callback. Maybe this one does and maybe this one does. So at each level here, driver has an option where it may register a callback that says, you know, when this IO request goes down and when the hardware fields that request, you know, I would like to hear about it and here's my IO completion routine. And the IO manager uh, is responsible for organizing all of that. And so in this particular case, the way it works is it's sending down these preemptive requests saying, dear hardware, do you have any keystrokes yet? And when it does get a keystroke, then it says, okay, this is handled now. It's got the data in this IO request packet. And then for each thing that registers a callback, the IO manager says, hey, you, you wanted to find out when an IO request has been processed? All right, here's the blob of IO request data, and I'm going to call your callback routine. Hey, you, here's the blob of data. I'm calling your callback routine. And it's because this thing up here is, you know, in the chain that it gets to see, it gets to say, you know, I want to find out when a keystroke is coming back, when it's been fielded, and that's how it actually sees the keystroke, when its completion routine is called uh, when it went down and when it's going down, it registers the completion routine and says, I want to hear when this is done. And when it's done, then the IO manager comes back and says, hey, it's done. Here's the blob of data that I got. Do something with it if you know what to do with it and all that sort of thing. All right. Is that clear? Not sure on the, if that makes sense. Anyone have any question on that? Yep. Uh, position that you register the handle. Uh, like, can only 
one driver say I'm going to handle the reactor or BBD class, or can you have two people of all responsibilities? Fundamentally, only one thing can really be at one level, right? So it's sort of like there can be race conditions there, right? So you could have two keystroke loggers, right? I could have control of the cap and my keystroke logger. And it's really a question of who registered first depends that, that dictates who gets what position. They could be, there could be no functional difference in terms of what data they see, but in some cases there could be a difference. So uh, can we go over to the board? So I probably should make um, another slide for this as well. But I'd, I'd done this, I'd done this description mostly on the uh, board last time. So let's say you have something like a full disk encryption stuff. Well, let's, let's start with your question first, right? So I'm just going to you know, draw this, 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 just say this is, uh, is it keyboard class zero? Right. And so this is the thing which points at control to cap. And now the question is, who registered first? So keystroke loggers, you know, we know at this point keystroke loggers can register above this keyboard class and see the data. Maybe they can register below, maybe they can't. But the question is, if you have two things which know that they can register above keyboard class zero, and they both do, you know, what happens? Are they in parallel? Is one get it before the other? And the answer is that one does get it before the other, and then therefore it just becomes a question of who registered first. So if this control to cap registers first, you know, if let's say there's, you know, their drivers load alphabetically or something like that, so control to cap loads before, you know, key sniff, or I think in the book it's like key logger. Something like that. So the control to cap loads first, this device registers, or sorry, this driver registers a device object and it gets put into this chain. Now this driver comes along and registers another device object and that also gets put in the chain. Now the thing, well, actually, because this guy came in second and because he said, I know I want it exactly above keyboard class zero, then when the second guy comes in, his is actually going to be, you know, put in at that level, right? So it's just sort of who registers first and what level they ask for ultimately dictates who gets what level. Now, the thing I wanted to say about, you know, why, um, what level you're at, whether you're an upper driver or a lower driver, why, why it matters in some cases, is I'd give the example of, um, you know, full disk encryption. Let's say there's full disk encryption thing, which is <coughs> encrypting the data. And again, this is the point of having these sort of, uh, abstraction layers is, let's say this is, call it device FDE, let's say this is FDE.sys. Right, so these are the devices, these are the drivers. All right, so FDE.sys attached to, let's say, uh, NTFS. Something like that. So let's say there's an ntfs.sys, which there is. ntfs.sys. That's a kernel driver. And it created a device called just ntfs. And this is a device where you can send IO request packets to it if you want to write files to ntfs file system. So the FD, so originally there was nothing. There was just, you know, some IO manager and ntfs. Then FDE comes along and registers this. Well, sorry. Let's say before FDE comes along, there's my rootkit. That's this, whatever. Uh, well, let's call it Stuxnet. <coughs> which is in reality MRX net this. Something like that. That registers. Blah. Maybe it's empty. Maybe it's not, right? So let's say you've got something which is trying to intercept IO request packets that are going down and targeting at the file system. Because, for instance, it's trying to hide files on disk. In this case, let's say it's hiding those exploit files on the USB drives, right? 
So this wants to see all I/O request packets coming down, saying, you know, are you trying to list a directory? If so, then when it comes back up and we've got that data, remember when when these completion routines get called and they come back up, each completion routine gets this I/O request packet, and so each of them could potentially manipulate the data as it comes up, goes down, etc. And so the point is, this guy is up here hiding files, right? But now let's say you've got a Stuxnet system and someone installs full disk encryption on it, right? And full disk encryption says, oh, I need to live right above NTFS, right? They install themselves and they're still in the chain and, well, in this case, I guess it's not actually going to make a difference, but I should have done it in the other order. Oh, well. Let's say the whole point of the FDE is that it also wants to see when data is going down, it's then doing the encryption so that when the data is ultimately written out, it's encrypted data. And then transparently when the data is coming back up, it decrypts it so that everything looks normal up here. Now in this case, it would make no difference, but what I was thinking of was more like if Stuxnet was at this level, then obviously if the data comes down and the FDE is like, you know, encrypting the data, then all of a sudden this thing which was expecting to see, you know, I'm um, really mixing things up here, but this thing which is expecting to see, you know, just regular file data coming down, uh, it would all of a sudden see garbage. And so uh, that's why the order here definitely matters and the order of attachment matters uh, because well, because of examples like this where you've got something where data is being changed or let's say you had, I could do another example like this where it'd be something like firewall, you know, zone alarm can be, can be and I think is uh, intercepting IO request packets being sent for network data. And so if zone alarm is at this level in the stack but I come in here and I add my rootkit one level below it, then all of a sudden my rootkit is no longer subject to the firewall rules and stuff like that. So understanding that there's this sort of system going on uh, is definitely important to know, you know one, you want to know who should be in these sort of chains. And two, if you're a rootkit author, you need to know that these things can be uh, messing with you if you're not put at the right level and if something new gets added in, for instance, you, your stuff could just break. Right? But for our purposes, for detection, Knowing who should be in these chains is important because then you know who should or shouldn't be filtering this data, such as something like Stuxnet. All right. I think it's time for another break and then I'll talk about the second way that you can man in the middle of this sort of data. It pertains to those little array of things right here, which turns out to be an array of function pointers. All right. Five minutes. <laughs> 